so um so I have planned today I did get back these M4s um I'll, maybe I'll just do five minutes on that uh, had maybe one or two things to say but not a whole lot everybody's fine I, well, I didn't get all of them back yet so you know if you didn't get yours back yet um I still have a couple half a dozen or so more to finish off uh I'll, I'll try and get those uh, finished off right after class here so I, I wanted to as usual have them all done but I didn't quite get get them all finished uh there is an example solution I'll go over that for a few minutes um uh, as a reminder, um, I haven't really posted assignment five yet, uh, and that's also I want to do that before now. But um, um, I'm still planning on assignment five to be due at the end of next week. Assignment five is going to be over ensembles. Um, in fact, it'll be over some stuff that I'll talk about today, or maybe not even until Thursday that we'll talk about. So, but I, I, again, I think I'm going to still uh, I'll try and get assignment five posted um, uh, tomorrow, or certainly before our next class meeting. Um, I still want to keep it due at the end of next week because um, just looking ahead, we've got this week, we got all of next week, uh, and then the week after that is Thanksgiving week. So uh, I would kind of like people to finish that up before uh, uh, the actual week of Thanksgiving. Um, so we'll have that posted, but yeah, look for the assignment five um, um, up here in the next day or so. Uh, and, and as usual, I'll probably talk about assignment five as well as finish up ensembles on Thursday a bit. So. Um, what else? A reminder about final projects. Um, I, uh, I, I, there were some people that uh, needed to select something, uh, select a new uh, data set. So I haven't checked if they did that or not when I asked, uh, but if that was you, make certain that you check that uh, just in another general reminder so I, I did see um, um, I hadn't seen a whole lot of additional commits made so I encourage you to uh, you know try at least work on that every week so try and do some progress make a commit uh, you know don't neglect it and do a bunch of stuff on the last week uh, just so that uh, uh, you'll have a, a smoother time of it um, and we'll actually get more um, uh, interesting results if you uh, keep doing stuff for the next four or five weeks uh, for the end of our course here so. um, okay so let me jump to the assignment four like I said I won't spend too much time on this uh, I had one or two things maybe to um, to mention on this so uh, of the ones I've gotten through so far nobody was really having any problems so um, um, I, I think that the tasks were relatively easy uh, heads up assignment five might be a little bit more uh, there'll definitely be a few more things for you to do on assignment five I don't know if it'll be tougher for anybody or not but um, uh, we'll see um, I guess my biggest thing on the first one when we were doing the linear uh, support vector machine is I had a couple people, um, you know, this, this is just a general visualization kind of thing. So when you're, when you're making a plot to visualize your, your data, you know, make sure you understand the purpose of it and why you're doing it. Uh, so, so some people were uh, creating um, the, the range of the decision boundary but we're using the unscaled data, so you end up with a line, you know, you're show, visualizing the decision boundary, kind of starting over here at like zero or something and going up to four. So, you know, uh, I mean, that's bad for a couple of reasons. So for one, you know, if, if your range isn't correct for the data that you're trying to visualize, um, uh, at best, at best, it, it pushes things, uh, makes things smaller for the actual stuff that you would like, the actual information you'd like to get out of the uh, figure, right? Uh, at, at worst, uh, you know, if you don't have your ranges right for your data, it makes the, f the figures unusable. So, uh, you know, d d just keep that in mind. I, I probably took off a point or two for that or this other one. Um, uh, but the, the general principle is think about why you're creating a figure. What, uh, the the purpose of the visualization there's there's information that people are supposed to be getting off of your figure uh, and you need to make it so that you can clearly see that information so if we, if we if 
if, if I was doing a class on data visualization, that'd be one of the first kind of uh, properties or important points about creating a figure is, is you know understand what you're doing, make certain that, that your figure communicates something, config, communicates that uh, idea or that, that result that you're trying to have it communicate. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the only purpose of these, it was rather explicit. Uh, I think everybody was fitting the linear uh, support vector machine correctly. Uh, the ones I've looked at so far were. Uh, so when you use a, a small value of C, it's going to, um, uh, it's going to do more regularization. So it will tend to minimize or even ignore outlier points. So you should have gotten a result like this, which basically uh, the one, one point uh, here on this data set for the first task uh, had this point that looks kind of outlierish. It's, 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 it looks different than the, the mass of the other. Um, um, these are our pos these should be the one or the positive examples up in the upper right hand corner, right? So uh, if you use more regularization, uh, you'll end up with a decision boundary uh, that kind of ignores that. Uh, which may or may not be good. Uh, I mean, if it really is an outlier, you, you would want to ignore that because if it's an outlier, you're more likely to see unseen data that looks more like in this area, in this area for the the ones and the zeros. And if it's not an outlier, well, um, then um, hopefully, you know, you would have gotten more points over that on, on like a random data set that you're trying to fit your data to. But, but we only had that one that was kind of stuck out there. So um, I didn't ask people to use a, a plot where you can see the decision boundaries, but if you're interested, uh, I mean, I, I'd given those before, not to mention given examples of doing the contour plots that I asked you to do. So you mostly just had to copy that code or, or maybe modify it slightly to do the next visualizations where you did the decision boundary. But for this one, I think everybody I checked was doing it by hand like I asked. So pulling out the parameters uh, and calculating the decision boundary and uh, uh, displaying it by hand instead of trying to do a contour plot. Um, if you plot the, uh, the um, margins, uh, basically, uh, in, in this, uh, the code I'd given you before, the circle around a point is supposed to be things that are being ignored or that are violating the margin. So, in particular, so we got a lot, you know, so having a small value of C uh, means that we put a lot, a lot of points we allow to be close to or violate the margin, including that one kind of point up there that, was, that may or may not be an outlier. Whereas, you know, the, the point of this was, so if you use a high value of C, you're doing less regularization, so it's going to try and minimize that margin uh, at all costs. So this was, I asked for like a C of 75, I think, and so everybody was doing that right that I checked so far. So you end up, you know, with, with things that uh, uh, keep as much stuff uh, from the margin as they can. So, but the margin has to be much smaller in that case. Uh, for example, you know, this data was still linearly separable, so you can get a decision boundary that, uh, that gets that point up there uh, on the correct side of it by having a high enough value of C. Um, anyway, so that's what the decision boundaries would look like if you plotted them um, or you tried to calculate um, the support margins, I should say, um, uh, would look like for those two different linear um, models. Um, I didn't see anybody miss this one yet so far, so, you know, um, it, it uh, um, if anybody needs to, let me know. I can, um, uh, in fact, I, I think that I pretty much have the same code uh, that, that you needed for this one uh, in the lecture notebooks. So uh, this is one way to do it, uh, using the norm from the linear algebra uh, to calculate those uh, Gaussian similarity. Um, it's really basically kind of the, the, um, uh, the distance squared there, uh, dividing by uh, that sigma squared. So, uh, anyway. I guess the only other comment, uh, so 
most people I think were doing the nonlinear fit correctly. Uh, I haven't caught anybody uh, not using the parameters correctly or passing those in the way they needed to. Right? So we, we kind of modified the task function you were supposed to create here to um, uh, pass in a couple of, um, of um, uh, the, the parameters that you needed, including the kernel and, and the, the C in this case, so, and, and the gamma. Um, if you did that right, I was basically looking for, you should have ended up with uh, a decision, this decision boundary. If you're, uh, oh no, th this is, this is you were, for the first one, you're supposed to use the built-in RBF. So you should, have pull, you should have passed in a string for the kernel, um, um, uh, which, which will give you the built-in radio basis function, uh, nonlinear. Um, uh, uh, kernel for this fit here. So I, I mean, I was mostly looking, when you do that, you get, you should have gotten exactly the same decision boundary, so you end up with one of the positive examples right on it up here, and you end up with one of the negative examples kind of right on the decision boundary over here, uh, and something that looks like that uh, if you visualize this. So Again, I make the same point here, and, and I maybe took off a point or two for people, so I had a lot of people uh, having like this range from like negative from zero to two or, or negative two to four uh, the, the same with the X there so I can't remember what people were doing on that to, to find that range uh, but you know the result is, is is you end up with lots of space uh, out there uh, on both sides above and below and the left and right um, and everything kind of squished down in the middle uh, and again, you can't really, you know, the, the, the plots that for people that did that, I, I couldn't really see the decision boundary, so I can't really check, uh, for example, that you seem to be getting exactly the decision boundary I was expecting, you know, with this, uh, with this zero point right on the line there, and, and that positive point right on the decision boundary up there. So, um, anyway, so I made a, a comment, uh, quite a few people were doing that, I don't know why. Um, and you didn't really have to do too much for the last part here. I, I, I hope that people kind of followed what was happening here. Right? So uh, it, it, we're, we're trying to make the point that we're really, you know, we're just really using your Gaussian kernel that you created by hand. Um, uh, but you should have gotten exactly the same thing, the, exactly the same uh, radio basis, uh, the, the same model um, as using the built-in radio basis function. So we re-implemented the Gaussian kernels here if you did everything correctly. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I've never had to do this myself, but I mean, it is possible um, to um, um, pass in your own function there as long as it's of the right form. So you can create your own uh, kind of kernel functions, uh, uh, but that would be kind of an advanced sort of thing to do, but that's what we're doing here, you know. So, uh, just just to, to tell you what's happening, I mean, basically all what what scikit-learn expects from this function is you should be able to pass in two arrays. Um, so notice that um, um, so if, like the, I, I put in a little bit of code here in the example solution to sh to show you. Um, um, what the result is of, of asking for the uh, uh, that function there to, to calculate the kernel similarities between two things. So in this case, uh, we just pull out five values uh, and calculate the, the similarity between the two things. Um, so. Uh, So, um, oh, right, so um, in that case, we just get uh, basically a similarity between every point um, and uh, every other point that we have. So we end up with a, a five by five um, uh, result here, right? Um, yeah, we're only, we're only getting, we're only passing in actually uh, five values here. Right? Or a little bit more complicated um, example, um, 
if we ask for the similarity between the original that had five values and something that has three, we get a five by three of similarity. So yeah, in this case, when we do the similarity to itself, we're going to end up every value end up with a one on the diagonal using your uh, the, the function that you did. All right, so so this plugged in this is just calling the function that you should have implemented on the the task two there in the middle of this little wrapper around it. But, but yeah, the, this should be just trying to create, calculate the similarity between each value and every other value. So you end up with a, a major. So it's, it's probably easiest to understand with something like this here. Um, uh, so if we pass in five values for each, we end up with a five by five matrix, uh, which is mirrored or symmetrical in this case. So. Um, anyway. So you didn't really have to do uh, anything uh, to get this part to work. Hopefully, uh, if your function was working, I had one person try to do something different here, one or two so far. Uh, it didn't really get this part working, but, but it should have been relatively simple. Uh, if you just pass in uh, the function instead of passing in the string RBF uh, and the other parameters correctly. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm, I was expecting uh, to get exactly the same fit, uh, including um, you know, this point pretty much around the decision boundary over here and, and this positive one on there. But, but we should have gotten the same one on both of these um, um, if you compare uh, a visualization of however you were plotting out your decision boundaries. Um, okay, yeah, so I think that's all I'll, I'll say on that. Let me know if anybody had any questions on that. There are that, that notebook is in there. Um, um, so there is an example solution. If there had anything that you wanted to look at in more detail, you can pull that down and take a look at it. Um, okay, let's move on to new things then. So, um, So we are what looking at uh, uh, the next chapter, uh, oh, chapter seven of the hands-on machine learning. So we're looking at ensembles this week. Um, uh, I probably won't get to it till Thursday, but uh, th these are really especially uh, the the. the so Pre previously, we looked at decision trees. So probably the most common type of an uh, ensemble is to create a bunch of decision trees uh, and, and uh, combine them together to make a classifier or you know to make a model. Um, so those are really what random forests are, and, and also uh, extra trees. Uh, they're both uh, types of ensembles on decision trees. So. But we'll get up to that. So, so first, uh, let's talk about kind of how you ensemble things and why you might want to uh, create an ensemble. Let me see if I'm up here. So, um, Oh, by the way, uh, just as a note, I, I pushed in like a fix, uh, but the, the notebook I had pushed in uh, before this morning, uh, when it was trying to plot the, uh, the call these functions to plot the um, uh, decision boundaries, was using a step size uh, like smaller than this, uh, which might take a long time on your system. So uh, for today, uh, for the lecture today, I, I made that much bigger. So you know, you won't get as much resolution if you make, if, if your step size for the mesh um, is bigger, but uh, of course it'll be a lot faster to, uh, to, to create the contour plot so you can visualize the resulting uh, decision boundaries that happen. Um, so yeah, I probably had that too small. I don't know why, it was like 0. .0002 or something like that um, uh, in the notebook I had pushed before, which might 
take way too long for you to, to wait around to get it to, to plot if you're trying to run these notebooks. So. Um, all right, let me open up the textbook too. I might need to look at the textbook for some things here. Um, quickly. Okay. Um, so, just to, to start off, um, so for machine learning predictors, uh, sometimes you can get a benefit out of creating multiple models and then combining the results of their models. And so it's, it's not guaranteed, it's not automatically you'll get a benefit. Uh, so there's some caveats uh, for how you can do this to get, uh, to, to make an ensemble that actually gives you better performance, um, uh, which this chapter talks about. We'll, we'll talk about um, um, some of the things you need to, to do uh, in order to make this work usually. So, um, so I already mentioned that the, the most common kind of ensemble is really ensembles of decision trees, right? So, so we, we talked about decision trees last week. Uh, the, the reason why is it's very easy to do uh, um, uh, the things we'll talk about, the bagging and the paste, pasting uh, on both features and on samples. Uh, so you can do uh, uh, sample bagging, um, or feature bagging uh, really easily with decision trees. Right? Uh, if you haven't read this, uh, if you haven't read the chapter yet or gone through the notebook, um, um, we'll probably get to that today. So uh, we'll say what we mean by bagging and pasting and some of this other stuff. So anyway, so it's easy to do that kind of stuff. So it's very easy to create uh, decision tree ensembles that um, uh, can often give you will we'll definitely give you better performance than just a single decision tree uh, and can often be uh, quite good. In fact, you know, random forests and extra trees are, um, you know, they'll the probably won't give you the state of the art, so they might not be able to compete with like a deep neural network or uh, some other things like that, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll often give good results, uh, you know, the same as maybe like a support vector machine in terms of performance. Um, so, you know, the most basic thing about an ensemble is if I have multiple, uh, let's just concentrate on classifiers to start with. Uh, so you can use ensemble for regression or for classification. Uh, so for, for classification, the most basic is, and again, let's also just think about uh, binary classification. So if I have three classifiers, um, I can just have them all classify a new uh, input um, and uh, we could just take the high the the, the, the you know, whichever had the highest number of votes uh, the highest number of classes on that thing right so again this is similar to when we talked about Caden nearest neighbors so you know if I have an even number of classifiers you might have to do something if I have uh, you know the same number of votes votes for uh, yes and the same number of votes for no and that's the kind of stuff you'd have to, to worry about uh, sort of the edge cases. But the general principle should be easy to understand, right? So, so th this is known as what hard, uh, a hard classifier. So, if I have multiple classifiers, uh, if you think of just as a vote, I just take the majority vote, right? And if I'm talking about multi-class problems rather than a binary classification, again, whichever one, whichever class uh, above the multiple classes had the most votes, we would just pick as the winner. Uh, but in that case, it might be more likely that you'd have a tie if you're doing hard classification. So you have to always worry about ties. Um, so um, the textbook had this example trying to give you an intuitive feel for um, how, uh, why an ensemble might uh, work better, uh, might work in some cases. Um, if you've ever read any stuff or run across the idea of wisdom of the crowd, sorts of things. Uh, that, that's kind of what the argument is that's 
being done here. So even if you have weak learners, uh, I'll, I'll just go through this example real quickly. So think about um, um, flipping an unfair coin where 51% uh, of the times it comes up as, what was it, as, a, uh, as like a head um, um, and 49% of the times is a tail. So uh, in this example, I don't think the textbook had this code in here, uh, but in this example we're recreating the figure from the textbook. Um, where we flip an unfair coin. Um, so we do that by generating a random number between zero and one, um, and if it's less than the head ratio or the head ratio, we can modify um, um, to be you know, 0.51, so 51% heads, um, which yeah, we're doing that here. Or we could do any ratio we wanted to with this code here, but uh, we're doing the same thing as in the textbook. So using 51% heads and 49% tails. Um, so um, looking at the figure here, you can kind of think of the the, the darker blue line here is kind of uh, supposed to represent an ensemble working here, right? So we've got what, uh, I think it was 10 separate um, runs of this unfair uh, flipper. And we're, we're keeping track of the ratio uh, for, for the history for, uh, how, many, how many did we do? Yeah, we did 10 uh, flippers here. Those are the uh, lighter lines in the, uh, the, the figure that we have here, right? So if you look at any individual uh, decision maker, the, the, the decision we're trying to make is, uh, you know, what do we think is the actual ratio of this coin that we're flipping? Is it a 50-50 coin, a fair coin? Is it uh, giving us uh, 55 heads to 45 tails? You know, um, how unfair is the coin? So for some individuals, uh, you know, they, they start off just because, uh, you know, flipping a coin is a random process. Uh, they get a couple of runs of tails at the beginning, um, right? So because of the, the, the law of large numbers, I mean, eventually, although in, in this one that I just ran, I don't think I'm setting the random number generator. So it's unusual uh, after to run 10,000 to still have something um, that's below or at 50-50 uh, uh, um, uh, on the ratio there. But, but I did get, you know, one, I get it actually a couple of them. We're still pretty close to 50-50. Right. Um, but um, uh, and but you know so some of the the, the random flippers though uh, ended up with an estimate uh, above 0.51. It's, it's also unusual to get really high above that as well. But you'll notice that um, um, there's lots of noise. Uh, I've only been able to sample flip a little bit, uh, but as you get more and more. Um, that law of large numbers I was talking about, uh, they'll, they'll tend to, to converge more and more closer to the true ratio of the history that, that they see, uh, which is, should be 0.51 in this case. Yeah. So I don't know if this is cheating or not, but uh, I mean, as you would expect, the, the ensemble here is really just, uh, you can just think of it as, it's, it's just, uh, this is reaching the point 10 times faster. So since I'm ensembling, 10 flippers that have done a thousand flips, uh, you, you can also think of that as at that point, it is like I have done 10,000 flips. So, so it's, it's a similar result to any one of these after 10,000. Right? Um, but um, I guess the, the, the argument kind of works here. So even if I have, uh, so in this case, what we're trying to say is looking down here, Say after just a, a thousand coin flips, my my um, um, flippers here are kind of weak learners, right? So so they um, don't have a lot of information, so they might not be giving good predictions individually. But by ensembling a bunch of weak learners, even if they're uh, quite weak, if they're only uh, uh, a little bit above. Uh, like doing random guessing, right? So if you're ensembling things or just making random guesses, uh, it won't work. You won't get good results in that case. But if, but as long as you have an ensemble of learners that are, um, like for the binary 
classification case, um, uh, do better than random prediction, do better than uh, just a 50-50 chance. Um, you can possibly uh, get uh, even a, a relatively strong uh, performance uh, if you have enough weak learners that you're ensembling together. Okay. So anyway, um, I don't know if that example uh, helps or not, but um, um, hopefully, you know, that, that gives you a little bit of an intuition about where and how, in some cases, combining the results of a bunch of them, of, of a bunch of models, even if the model, individual models themselves are not very good, as long as they're doing something, as long as they're not just completely random, um, and if, if you have enough of them, you can uh, uh, get much better predictions using the ensemble of a bunch of them. So, um, okay. So for the assignment five, that again I haven't posted that yet, but um, one of the first things you'll do is something similar to what is done here: um, is to just uh, um, create ensembles of a couple of different classifiers. Uh, and uh, test its performance on some data set. Right? So, um, scikit-learn allows you to create voting classifiers really, really simply. So, um, basically, all you do is you individually define classifiers and then say, "Here's a list of classifiers. Create a uh, voting classifier from them." Okay. So. Um, So yeah, I mean, this, this uh, example is probably exactly the, the same as what our textbook does. But here's an example of doing the uh, um, voting classifier here, right? So, you know, we just use the voting classifier in class from scikit-learn. Um, there's also a voting regressor, so you can, ask, you can do regression problems um, uh, using uh, an ensemble. Um, in this case, what we're just doing the moon's data set, which I think we've seen before, so uh, it looks something like this. It's a little bit, a little bit noisy here, a bit tough to see, but the decision boundary is going to be definitely nonlinear. Um, and our um, positive classes are the triangles in this case, uh, and the, the, the negative or the zero classes are the circles, uh, again, over here. Um, so what the default, if you create a voting classifier, uh, I think is hard. So if you don't specify, what to do to use uh, just hard voting, which you know simply means that uh, take the majority vote, right? And I don't know how it breaks like a tie or something if I gave it four classifiers, but it probably it does something uh, in that case. Um, but yeah, all you have to do is, is you know we're just passing in a we're actually passing in um, a list of tuples. So uh, I, th I think you can pass in like a dictionary to, um, let me see the way, let me, let me check the textbook's code real quickly. Uh, it did it the same way, yeah, so. Um, so yeah, in this way, in this case, I guess it's just expecting um, a bunch of uh, tuples where you have the name and then uh, the classifier, so. Uh, one technical thing about this, um, so when you actually fit uh, like one of these voting classifiers, um, it, uh, it does like a copy. So you give it the estimators that you want to use, uh, but you, don't, you could train them if you wanted to, but it basically just makes a copy of those estimators and trains them on the data, fits them on the data that you ask it to, each one individually. Right? So. Um, so the only thing it's doing for these estimators, uh, it would ignore any, any previous training that you might have done when you passed it in, uh, but it will use the same model in terms of your meta parameters, like uh, what the solver we're using for logistic regression, um, um, uh, and our, like our C parameter, and that kind of stuff. So, um, so here what we're using, uh, these are all classifiers, so we're using logistic regression, which remember is actually does classification by default, a uh, decision tree, um, and a support vector classifier um, here. Um, since we're using SVC, um, it should be doing a nonlinear, so it should be using uh, like a, a radio basis function probably 
by default for our support vector classifier. I think that's probably the same estimators that the um, textbook used. Although, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, in the lecture notebook. I, I give some metaparameters. It, it uh, looks like it. Uh, the textbook just used the, um, uh, the the defaults for all those. So I can't remember why I, I changed these uh, all these different metaparameters here. Um, Anyway, um, this is, I mean, you know, besides that, besides specifying multiple classifiers, uh, once you create this ensemble, like using a voting classifier, then you, know, you can use it in the same way that you should be uh, familiar with at this point. So you can fit a set of data uh, and the other kinds of methods to get, uh, well, um, um, some of the methods that we've looked at, you know, like getting probabilities and things like that, you can get from the whole ensemble. Um, so, oh, uh, I don't want to skip ahead to that. Just a second. Um, all right, so that that's the basic. And, and so uh, here, when we do the decision boundary, this is really the decision boundary of the ensemble. So you know, it's um, uh, is not particularly all that smooth, which to me, uh, one of the things when I look at something like this is, you know, how smooth or how uh, more um, um, special casey, you know, how more jagged does the decision boundary look, right? If it's smooth, it's probably regularizing a lot, so it might be better at predictions, uh, assuming it's, it's, it's giving it a nice smooth uh, decision boundary. Uh, and this one still looks like, uh, you know, it's got a lot of areas where it, uh, um, does some kinds of uh, strange things, trying to pick up, uh, you know, trying to overfit possibly to some of the data points that it has. Right? Um, but for an ensemble, you know, the more varied and uh, different things you ensemble together, um, the the better potentially that you will do in terms of giving getting uh, low bias. Um, and uh, 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 good variance. Remember that bias variance trade off that we've talked a little bit about in this class. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if this case, the, the it doesn't um, necessarily always work. Uh, for this Moon data set. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the textbook shows uh, that, that you do get a little bit of an import of, of a improvement. Um, I don't think I'm getting an improvement here, at least for the whatever my random seed setting is. Um, so, you know, these were the in, these are the performance on the individual classifiers. So after we fit the model, uh, in this case, we were holding back some test data. So we, uh, we generated some Moon data and we split off 25% uh, to hold back for some testing here. Um, and we can compare the performance of the individual classifiers to the uh, ensemble. Um, and we actually end up not meeting the performance of the best, uh, the one, the support vector classifier here uh, does a little bit better. Um, but, um, If um, let me try, I think that uh, this won't take too long to rerun. I'm just curious why in the notebook I had. Uh, let's, let's try uh, just going back and using all the defaults uh, instead of specifying some of these parameters here, um, like our textbook does. See if we get the same results as the textbook gets. So um, if we don't specify any of the um, metaparameters for the three different classifiers we want to build, uh, 
Let's see what we get uh, in that case. So we refit our model. And uh, replot. Hmm. So, so yeah, the uh, I mean, it looks a little bit smoother to me when I look at the decision boundary if I don't specify the uh, the meta parameters there. Um, and uh, let's redo this. So, um, well, yeah, but I'm still getting kind of the same thing I was getting before. Not not the same thing the textbook was showing. So, uh, but don't be too surprised or disappointed by that. So let me just discuss that a little bit. And, and uh, I, I think on your assignment five, you might get the same kind of thing. So uh, because we're, we're going to be using kind of a made up data set like this, so you won't necessarily be able to get a good example of an ensemble outperforming uh, the individual classifiers. Um, so one thing about that, you know, the, 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 the textbook discusses this a bit is, if you want to get better performance, you really need to, if you're ensembling different kinds of classifiers like this, they need to be pretty independent from one another. Uh, there's different ways you can do that. Uh, but, you know, uh, in this case, since we're, since we're uh, end up fitting them all on the same training data, they are likely to um, be misclassifying a lot of the same stuff. Okay, so they're likely not to be all that independent. So even though they're different classifiers, um, um, they're, they're really using the same training data set in all three cases. Um, so that argues that they're going to be making this, a lot of them making the same kinds of mistakes uh, as one another. So when that happens, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, if they're not a lot of independence, if they're not good on different areas of the, of the data set uh, or of the space that you want to try and model, um, uh, you won't get much, if any, improvement on the ensemble, right? And that's kind of what's happening here. Um, so the ensemble doesn't uh, doesn't outperform the best one that we get, uh, the support vector classifier here. Um, Oh, the textbook's using a random forest classifier. Anyway, um, okay. So let's move on. So uh, you can also do what's known as soft uh, voting. So basically, what this does is going to take a weighted vote. Uh, again, this is similar. You can do the same thing for K-nearest neighbor. So we've discussed a similar concept before. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, like the textbook says, all of the classifiers have to support um, the predict prob pr predict probability method, right? So you need to be able to fit a model, but also uh, get back information about how confident or how likely it is that its prediction um, um, is correct or not. So like a usually a number between zero and one for the predict probability. Uh, and so not all classifiers will do that. Um, so like the textbook discusses, uh, if you want to use a support vector machine, it doesn't do that by default, although you can ask it to generate, to estimate the, the probabilities by doing cross-validation. So really that's what, whenever you pass in probability equals true for a support vector classifier, it, it can't natively, um, you know, the way it works, it doesn't, um, um, it doesn't uh, 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 natively um, uh, have that capability to give like an estimate of how confident it is. Uh, but uh, you can have it um, estimate that, uh, so it'll, it'll run multiple uh, training, so it'll do some cross-validation in order to trying to estimate probabilities. Um, so of course that's, that makes it much, uh, the, the performance goes down a lot uh, when you do that. So it's not practical to do this for really large data sets. But, um, 
So anyway, in this case um, uh, here, uh, uh, we're pressed to do this. Usually, uh, when you can do it, um, um, you will tend to get slightly better performance using soft voting. So, uh, you know, where you take into account uh, which classifiers are more confident um, on their predictions uh, with, with kind of a soft voting mechanism. So, you know, the, the way it does it is something like a weighted uh, average. So it's going to take something like the probability times the, 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 uh, the prediction um, and sum those up. Um, um, so if you can do both of them, usually the, the soft voting will give you, uh, if one of them is better than the other, soft voting, soft voting would usually be the, the better one. But again, I think in this data, uh, using the Moon's data set and these three classifiers, you probably won't see uh, any difference here. So again, it's not a real great uh, illustration of an ensemble doing anything. But in this case, for the soft voting, um, um, oh well, yeah, I went back to using uh, those those classifiers with the uh, different sets of metaparameters. Um, so we get again kind of a messy decision boundary uh, in that case. Uh, let's see what I get on the results here. So uh, that looked a little bit more like what the textbook got. Um, um, so in this case, we end up with uh, uh, not really much, but maybe a slight, uh, about the same, if not just a little bit better than the best uh, classifier we had on the ensemble there. So, uh, I'll have to go back and look at that. So, so I don't know why... We're getting such different results on the uh, individual classifiers than what we had before. You know, we're getting like 91% last time for the SVC. Of course, I had modified it to uh, remove the, to just be all the defaults. So. Let me try this just one more time with the, with just a, uh, Logistic regression and decision tree, uh, but uh, the basic defaults not changing anything. Oops. Oh yeah, in this case, uh, so there's an example of what I was talking about, or what the textbook talks about. So um, uh, without setting the probability to true, uh, we can't do the soft voting classifiers, so we've got a, a classifier that doesn't uh, support the uh, attributes. So I do have to at least um, uh, specify that if I want to do what I want to. Uh, what's that keyword? Uh, prediction. Let me open up the documentation here real quick. Um, probability. So, there we go. Okay. Um, so, it should allow me to do it, I hope. So yeah, that case, um, yeah, the support, the, the, whatever, the parameters I had for the support vector classifier aren't all that good, so um, just using the defaults, getting above 90%, 91%, so, uh, tends to be outperforming the ensemble on this example. So, again, not really a great example. I should try and find something that works better usually. Um, but we're, you know, um, as a final point on that, you know, we are, it would be tough to find a good example just using these three classifiers. We really need to use uh, something where we're training these classifiers on different subsets of our data um, or doing something else so that they're not so similar um, uh, if we want to get uh, um, 
ensemble that's going to be outperforming the individuals uh, in this case. Right? So they're probably they're probably too um, um, uh, too homogenous in this case. They uh, they have they're too dependent, they're, they're too similar to one another. So. Um, but yeah, that leads us into the next um, topic here: the the bag and pasting. So. Um, common thing to do to, to get things that are potentially probably weaker learners but uh, that are going to be more independent um, is to do this kinds of uh, boot, bootstrap aggregation. So bagging is really just a shortening of bootstrap aggregation um, or pasting. I, I don't remember if pasting is uh, um, um, a shortening of something. So. Um, to me, just just to, to uh, you know, cut to the chase on what these mean is all we're doing uh, for the the bagging or the pasting is we're sampling um, our data set. Okay, so so the first one here, we can we can either sample the features or the uh, um, uh, or the the samples. Right. So so if I have like a data set. Generic data set that we normally um, uh, represent as a table. Uh, and we have like our input feature one, input feature two. So the features tend to be the columns up to M features. And we have sample uh, one, sample two. Probably shouldn't use sample here uh, because uh, I'm, I'm using sample also in the, the, the idea of, um, of selecting some samples at random here. So, uh, so let's just. All these are um, uh, uh, input one, uh, input two, input three, up to use n for the number of inputs that we have for a model, right? So um, bagging and pasting is really just uh, sampling. So uh, here, uh, uh, what we're going to do is, you know, if we have n inputs, I might randomly sample. Um, uh, uh, 10 inputs and just use those to train a model with. All right. um, so, and the only difference between bagging and pasting is one is doing the sampling with replacement and one is doing it without replacement. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, if we do it with replacement, uh, that's bagging, uh, and if we do it without replacement, that's um, uh, pasting, according to the textbook. I don't know, I don't know any easy way to remember that just, except to just memorize it. So, so and, and hopefully you know what we mean by sampling with or without replacement. So, uh, again, if I'm, I'm, if I'm selecting 10 inputs to train a model with, uh, I'm, I'm sampling from my inputs. Uh, so if I'm doing it with replacement, I, I might select input 1 to train my model with, but I would put it back so I could end up selecting input 1 multiple times. Right. So if you're doing it with replacement, I can potentially end up training uh, with one of my inputs more than once uh, when I create my model. And you know, a good question you might ask: so Why would you ever want to do that? Uh, it, it turns out though that it is useful. Uh, you, you get slightly different um, characteristics in terms of the bias variance trade-off. Uh, but uh, but 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 sampling with replacement um, can give you good. Separate models uh, that work well with an aggregation. So, um, and uh, just to jump down here a little bit, um, Um, so, I mean, you can, eat, you can, when I'm building individual models to make an ensemble from, um, I can just randomly sample from the inputs, right? So if I'm building three models, called model one, model two, model three, uh, I might take 10 inputs, um, so I'd train model one with some randomly selected 
10 inputs, that trans valve two with a different randomly selected 10 inputs. Right? So in that case, I, I'm selecting whole uh, uh, inputs, um, uh, sampling from those to train our models. You can also uh, sample features instead. And this can be very useful as well to create a bunch of independent weak learners. So in that case, I might ran, I might select just feature, you know, three features at random, uh, and train model one with just those three features, and train model two with a different set of randomly selected features, and so on. Right? So you can do one or the other. You can do both. Um, so. Um, so let me go back. So the, the, the default is to be sampling from what I'm calling the inputs here in this discussion. All right. So uh, da, 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 da. Oh, and um, um, I didn't mention it yet, but uh, this makes the most sense. Um, I mean, you, you, you can create a bagging classifier with any kind of, of classifier that you use for your sample. So you, you can bag a bunch of support vector machines, or you can bag a bunch of uh, logistic regressors if we're doing classification. Uh, but it works particularly well with decision trees, because it's, it's very easy. Uh, for, for all these models, it's very easy to do samples of the, uh, the inputs. But, for decision trees especially, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, when I'm doing feature sampling. Okay. Um, and by the way, to jump, jump ahead here, I mean, this is really all a random force is. A random force is just uh, a big bag of, of, of deci separate decision trees that have been uh, trained on different uh, samples of the data set. Okay. Um, so that's what we're doing here in this, again, this example is probably directly from the textbook. So, you know, instead of creating different kinds of classifiers um, and ensembling them as a voting, uh, we're asking it to create a hundred decision trees. So, so we're using all the same kind of classifier, but we're going to use sampling. Um, so by setting bootstrap to true, we're going to be doing the, um, um, uh, we're going to be doing the bagging, so we're going to be doing the bootstrap aggregation, which means that we're going to sample with replacement. Right? Um, and I think the default, um, um, hopefully this is discussed a little bit further down here in the lecture, but the default is only to do uh, input sampling. Right? So if we don't specify anything else, uh, what we're going to end up with on this example here is a hundred separate decision trees will be um, will be trained. They will be trained on all the features, but each one will be trained on a different sub, a different uh, uh, random sample of the inputs. All right. Um, so, oh. Um, Oh, I got that wrong. So, uh, sorry if I don't, hope I'm not confusing people, but we're actually using um, uh, 500. We're actually building 500 decision trees here. So, so the, the, the number of estimators is the number of different classifiers that we're going to create and train. Uh, max samples is that's uh, however many uh, inputs we have, we're, we're going to sample 100 of them by specifying max samples. The, and, and again, I don't know what, what the default is, but, but here we're using the, um, in this example, we're using um, a, uh, a random, uh, uh, an artificial data set using the moons. Um, and we had what, um, I have to go all the way back up here, here to where, when I generated the, the moons data set first. Uh, we actually have 2,500 inputs. We have 2,500 rows or 2,500 rows uh, in our Moon's data set that we're using, um, with uh, only two features. So we've only actually got two features. Uh, on this data set there. Which one, feature two. Um, 
so yeah, back to just understanding this. So that means that uh, we're, we're each one of our uh, decision tree uh, estimators that we're creating, we're only going to randomly sample 100. Uh, and we're doing it with uh, bootstrap true, so we're doing it with potentially with replacement. So sometimes, uh, even though 100 is quite a bit smaller than 2,500, we could still potentially end up using the same input more than once uh, when we train one of these uh, 500 estimators. Uh, the default uh, is what? Um, uh, So if you don't specify the max samples, um, um, notice the, the textbook discusses this a little bit. Um, so the default is 1.0. So this, this is, uh, if you give a float, it does it as a ratio. So actually the default is to take exactly the same number of samples that you have um, as um, your inputs. Right. Uh, and that doesn't make sense if you're doing um, um, if you're doing pasting, but if you're doing bagging where you're doing sampling with replacement, even if I'm taking 2,500, that means that I'll be taking a lot, but I'll have a lot of uh, I'll be training multiple times on many of my samples. Right. So, so if I take 2,500 out with replacement, I might end up training on input three five times. But then other ones I won't train on at all, right? So, so if I'm doing sampling and replacement, some of them I'll end up training on multiple times. Other ones I won't end up selecting at all in my random uh, sample. Okay? Uh, and that's kind of by design, right? So that, that only makes sense if you're doing with replacement, so if you're doing bagging. If, if I'm doing it without replacement, uh, if I select 2500, that means that I'm going to train on all the inputs. Uh, so I won't be doing all of my models um, um, that we um, um, put together in this bag would be trained on all of the samples. So none of them would be different. That wouldn't be good. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, so uh, So in this case, let's just look at the resulting decision boundary from creating this. This um, so it's useful to make certain that you understand, um, you know, kind of what's happening here, right? So, you know, the, the basics. We, we're, we're we're creating 500 separate estimators. Uh, in this case, they're all relatively weak. You know, so we, have, we potentially have 2,500 inputs, but they're being trained on a small number of that, only 100. So each one only uses uh, one. 100 of the 2,500. Uh, since we're doing it with replacement, some of them uh, are using even less than that. So they might resample the same um, uh, input more than once. Right? Um, so notice, I mean, one nice thing if you compare this to the, to the previous ones, uh, to me, you know, the decision boundary looks much better here. Uh, so we're finally getting something that um, uh, might generalize better than what we've seen before. Because it's not doing any of those really weird things that it would indicate that it's over uh, fit uh, and, and uh, pulling in some, some stuff uh, that really uh, is uh, um, um, not going to uh, do well in terms of uh, uh, predicting unseen stuff, right? Um, you know, again, th this is a, a tough one to separate because with the two features, uh, the, the way that we generated it, uh, we're not going to be able to perform very well because we got a lot of stuff that's, that overlaps. But there really is uh, a decision boundary that's nonlinear. Uh, it's probably close to something like this is the real decision boundary that, this, that the Make Moons data set um, is creating here. Um, anyway, so yeah, so if we look at the, uh, the accuracy um, um, for this, um, Oh, this, this is the accuracy for one decision tree that we train on all of the data, right? So, so we just fit it to all 2,500 of our inputs. Uh, we get about 86% 8, accuracy. Um, whereas uh, the, the, the bag of the 500 decision trees, you know, we, de we definitely get an improvement. 
All right, so it's getting like 91% here. And that's probably not a fluke. That's, it, it probably is doing much better uh, than an, one individual decision tree over all the ones versus a bunch of 500 weak decision trees uh, that are only trained on small subsets. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we probably are getting a definite uh, improvement um, on the performance over uh, an individual one here. And again, to me, that's you know one of the reasons is like if you look at the decision boundary for the single decision tree, uh, it's no longer it, it's got bad um, 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 uh, bias, uh, so it's probably uh, overfit, um, right? Um, yeah, so it does well. It would do well if we were asking it to make predictions on the data we trained it with, but it's it's not going to do so well um, on unseen data. Because it's not really making a very good decision boundary yet. So. Um, okay, yeah, and I should probably wrap up. So, uh, just some final things here. Uh, and we'll leave like random forest and some other stuff uh, for Thursday. Um, so, if you understood what I was talking about for sampling with replacement, um, that means that. Um, um, even if I'm sampling with a replacement for the whole, you know, the same number of inputs that I have, um, I'm still going to have uh, some that I've uh, trained with multiple times and some others that I don't end up training with. So uh, you'll see this concept, the out-of-bag instances. So um, again, if I've got um, uh, 500 decision trees here, um, if we don't specify the max samples, uh, but we are using bootstrapping. These are all going to be trained with 2,500 inputs, but because it's doing bootstrapping, it's doing sampling with replacement, every one of the 500 trees is going to have uh, some number of inputs that it didn't actually, well, did, that we didn't use to fit the individual estimator. Okay? Um, so those out of bag samples uh, are the same idea as. as data that was held back. So they didn't see those uh, for, if we're looking at something that was out of bag for an individual one of these decision trees, it didn't see that when we fit it, the model with it, right? So you can use the out of bag samples in a similar way to what we did our test data. So we can use it to give us an estimate of um, how well the individual classifiers will do uh, on generalizing. So on making predictions on data it hasn't seen before. All right. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but but the the the, the um, uh, the the summary on that is basically uh, if you're doing like a bagging classifier like this or something like a random tree. Um, um, I can get an estimate without having, you know, without holding back uh, uh, unseen test data. Um, I can use the out of bag score uh, to get uh, an idea of how it's going to generalize, how it will do on data uh, that uh, it wasn't trained with. And that's kind of what that, that out of bag uh, um, um, items give you, basically, here. Um, yeah, and finally, we didn't have any examples on this, but when you're doing bagging, you can also sample on the features. Like, like I already mentioned, it wouldn't make much sense here when I've only got two features, but if I had uh, a really big data problem that had thousands or tens of thousands of features, this can really help performance to make like a random tree where I'm sampling on input features. Um, so to do that with the bagging classifier, um, yeah, you specify uh, uh, these two parameters will tell you uh, the number of features to sample from and uh, whether to uh, sample with or without replacement uh, by specifying the, the bootstrap on the features. Right? Does that make sense? So, so again, this, this is working like the same as like the max samples and the bootstrap uh, for the inputs that we saw before. So we can, uh, specify the max features. Um, so the 
number of features to sample on um, and whether we want to uh, sample features with or without replacement uh, using that other parameter there. So. If you do both sampling, it is a final thing like the textbook says here, if you do both sampling of inputs and sampling of features, you're getting kind of random patches of the data that you uh, build on your individual estimators have. So that's, that's really what the random patches uh, uh, mean here. Um, or do I have that backwards? So, um, yeah, so I mean, sam if I'm sampling both uh, it training inputs and features, uh, I guess some people call that taking random patches, right? If I'm only just sampling features but using all the inputs, that's just random subspaces of the input features uh, that we're building models with. So that's just terminology that you might run across. So. Um, all right, yeah, so that's it for today.